Okay, this is uh, this is dominant genes. Birth story. My mother, out of love, stitches up my heart, pulling the thread tight to make sure it won't rupture again at the same spot. My heart is defenseless, ready to come undone at the next crisis. While she's at it, my mother stitches up my mouth too and turns her needle and thread to my brain. So this is a, um, a hybrid chapbook, so it's nonfiction and poetry. Um, and sometimes it's unclear which is which, uh, which is one of my favorite things to do um, with, with, uh, with these hybrid chapbooks is to sort of blend the lines between where poetry ends and where nonfiction begins. So some of these, um, I'm not gonna tell you which is which, but um, you know, as I'm reading, you, you, you could guess maybe. <laughs> this is called Gods in the Surf. I envy my American city friends. Their impractical swimsuits made to be seen, not touched by sea, unable to stand in weak Florida surf. I was born by the ocean, an island child, the core of me salt water and seagulls howling. We wade into the gulf, the ocean holds us, amniotic fluid shot with jumping mullets, Jellyfish constellations too small to see, worming their stinging tendrils into skin. Waves spitting shark eggs and tangles of seaweed. Pelicans strafe the water. We gorge on chips, chug shitty beer under a rainbow umbrella. My city friends tell stories, innocent childhood beach trips, Florida vacations, coconut sunscreen. Back home, people saw gods in the surf, watery limbs and hair made of dirty foam. Fishermen went out to sea, came back, nets full of prawns to bombed out homes. Children tried to hide in the sand, evading military planes only to shatter on landmines. I never saw visions in the waves, but I knew a boat with no motor and no lights could take me across a lagoon at night. And if I heard a helicopter, I should sink my body into the ocean and trust it to hold me. So this collection is really about um, the ways in which we inherit more than just our physical traits. Uh, we also inherit culture, we inherit language, we inherit um, the ways that we see ourselves. And so um, in dominant genes, I'm uh, very much concerned with tracing matrilineal heritage back through the women of my family um, who are, when we are Tamils from Sri Lanka um, and many of us came to North America as refugees. Um, and, you know, I, I spent the first half of my childhood in Sri Lanka and the second half in the US. Um, and so I guess many of us also grew up third culture, which means that um, the idea of inheritance, the question of inheritance became even more important. My parents crossed an ocean and lost me. I carved myself a new face. They searched and searched and found God instead. They built an altar for God in the office room closet, sliding doors, LED lights, images of God in all his iterations, Vishnu, Parvati, Shiva, Murugan, even a tiny portrait of Jesus and a bottle of holy water shaped like the Virgin Mary, so as not to leave out the God of their new country. My parents took to God like they took to America, like they took to money locked in savings accounts. We used to be penniless, stateless, godless. Like money, like country, God was a newish something. My mother now spends her days praying. She and God have a thing. 
My father roams the empty rooms, fills them with the voices of angry white pundits on TV. When I visit, we fight, God and I, for my parents' affection. We're siblings born too far apart in age to be friends. Sun God. In the Mahabharata, the Mahabharata is a uh, Sanskrit language epic, um, epic poem from um, the Indian subcontinent um, that was written many, many hundreds of years ago. And it is one of the central um, sort of, you know, major texts of the Sev region. In the Mahabharata, Karna, the infant, is set afloat in a basket. Illegitimate son of a princess and the son, raised by a merchant, his real story is one of self-destruction. I try to be an expert on this subject. Karna grows up to be an archer, the finest in the world, until his little half-brother comes along to best him. Karna finally makes a friend, and just his luck, it's the villain of our tale, and now he's on the wrong side of a holy war. All the gods get involved. Even his mother comes to him, the mother he yearns for, but now she's come and revealed herself only to ask him not to kill his half-brother. Karna is no Moses, and he will have no redemption. No hordes of followers, no one to pray over him, no. He will be a symbol of how even the sun will abandon us, of how the wrong birth is deserving of pity, but not herohood. And how exactly did the sun get a woman pregnant is what I wanna know. I'm told this is a bad question. I'm full of bad questions. Like if I peel open my labia in the light, will I too have to send away a child in a basket on the river? And what about masturbation? Was the princess being punished for digging inside herself for her own deep pleasure? Why can't women step inside the temple when they're bleeding? I imagine little Karna sits at breakfast while his adoptive mother stirs the sambar and he is full of bad questions. Like if you're my real mother, then why do I feel like a God? And what I wanted to know at his age was if one man's freedom fighter is another man's terrorist, then are we on the wrong side of this war? But this is a bad question. Um, for most of my 20s, my parents um, and, and the, the bigger sort of extended family, as well as the bigger South Asian diaspora community around them, they were really trying their hardest to marry me off. Um, they wanted to arrange a marriage for me and because they didn't trust me to do it on my own, I was too wild and they did not think that I would actually bring home somebody they wanted. So it's, um, so there, I went through a lot of like times where I had to meet suitors um, and I only did it to make my parents happy, but then this happened. Banana tree wedding. My parents consult an astrologer about my future. The stars say that I will be married twice. Disappointed and alarmed, my parents discuss with the astrologer who is an expert on circumventing fate. When I'm home for Christmas break, my parents ask me to go to temple. I normally wouldn't wear a sari, but they insist. They take me to a temple that's housed in a strip mall behind the dentist's office where I had my wisdom teeth removed years before. At the threshold, we take off our shoes to show respect to the gods. No one else is here so early on a Saturday. According to the sign posted at the entrance, the temple is closed but the door is unlocked and we let ourselves in. Inside, the temple is dark and carpeted. On the altar, an eight by eight foot square of blankets holds brass lamps, copper jugs of grains, a fire pit, 
a bearded coconut wearing a skirt of mango leaves, and so large an array of flowers that I can't even name them all. It's a wedding ceremony, my wedding ceremony. The priest arrives with his six-year-old son who sits in a corner with his Game Boy and doesn't look up again until we leave. The priest drags out a potted two foot tall banana tree from the closet, a young sapling that fans out its three leaves to the chilly air. At my confused look, the priest says, this is going to be your new husband. Two hours later, the wedding ceremony reaches its climax. Traditionally, the groom ties a golden thread around the bride's neck as a necklace, but the banana tree is a tree. So instead, my father offers me the necklace and asks me to tie it around the tree. I almost refuse, but then I think, when else am I going to get to be the groom? So I do it. I tie the golden thread around the stem of the tree and we're married. After the ceremony concludes, my father hands me a machete and I kill my first husband, the poor little sapling who will now know, who will now never know the coziness of topsoil. The tree won't go down in one blow, so I hack at it again and again, hitting just below the golden necklace, the trunk's fibers splitting open and leaking sap. I'm a murderer and a widow. My parents sigh their collective relief. That night, hushed phone conversations happen all over the world as my family spreads the news that we've tricked the stars. To all my suitors and the aunties who send them my way. When I was young, my family kept two ducks and a goat in the backyard to give me duck eggs and goat's milk for breakfast. Now they ask me to accept a balding accountant, his body doughy, his politics centrist. I had chicken pox at nine months old and my aunts and uncles took turns fanning the sores with bundles of curry leaves so I wouldn't be tempted to scratch. Now they ask me to marry a man who expects me to cook for him on our first date. When I say I don't want an arranged marriage, they say it's not an arranged marriage if we date for a few months first. My aunties pass my photos and details around the globe my eligibility stored in the cloud. They learn Gmail just so they can match mate, by which they mean find me a boy who looks like their husbands, a boy who prays, who keeps it in the cast. And they say it's my decision, but not if my decision is no. In order to craft a wife who puts her husband first, you have to convince her she's not the seed in her own fruit. As a toddler at temple prayer meetings, I pretended to be a radio and I belted out Bollywood songs. And when they tweaked my ear and told me they would turned off the radio, I twisted it again and turned myself on. This is my last piece, it's called Mother. My mother tells me to be careful. I'm 12 years old and we've just moved to a city outside of Boston. We live in an apartment complex that my white fiance will call shit housing 20 years later when we visit. I walk to school every day, a two mile stroll along a busy road and my mother tells me to be careful. What she means is keep your head down Keep walking, don't talk to anyone, I'm sorry. I'm 15 and my adolescent terrified rabbit face is shifting into something that draws glances from older men. Their heads turn to watch me and though I don't notice, though I'm deep in my teenage myopia and I just want my mother and the men to leave me alone, she sees them and she tells me to be careful. What she means is, 
The world is cruel to women. Watch your back. I'm 20 and I tell my mother I'm in love with a woman I met at my university's queer student group. My mother is silent on the phone, then tells me it's a phase everyone goes through. And don't I know what happens in the girls only schools back home? Everyone does it, but I'll get over it. She tells me to be careful. What she means is, this isn't real love. At 27, I start dating an older white man and my mother is begrudgingly happy. Better a man than a woman, better cis than trans, better straight than queer, better older than younger, better white than black. Her prayers have been answered, but she tells me to be careful. What she means is don't get pregnant. At 30, I'm married and my ovaries are growing cysts that burst in sharp pain. I need to take hormones to control them and my partner and I decide never to have kids. My mother tells me to be careful. What she means is too many hormones could damage her grandchildren. At 59, my mother falls down the stairs and dislocates her shoulder. Her ligaments are floating free inside her, snapped as one bone popped itself out of its socket. She needs surgery, physical therapy, and two years of healing. I call her to tell her to be careful. What I mean is, I can't understand the fragility of your body. What I mean is, will I become soft and breakable too? What I mean is, don't leave me. Thank you.